Okay, I think we're live. Cool, we're live. Uh, hey guys, my name is Spencer, and this is going to be an intro workshop to Unity. Um, so to get started, um, the slides that I'm showing here, I'm only going to show for the first bit, but they're all available at this URL. And so if you want to come back and revisit this, um, or you could watch the VOD later, you can do that as well. Um, but the, these will be here for the duration of the hackathon. Okay, so the first step is that we're going to need to download Unity Hub, which will allow us to download different versions of the Unity game engine. You can do that by going to this link here um, and then clicking on the Download Unity Hub button. And so let's just assume that you've got that installed already. What we need to do is we need to go ahead and install the version of Unity that we're going to be using for this, which is 2019.36 F1. So to do that, you're going to see a Unity Hub um, window pop up. Uh, it should be empty for your list of projects. You then click on the Installs tab, Add, and you select the version you want, hit Next. Um, I do not, we don't need any of these build supports for this because I'm on Windows right now. So we're just, it comes pre-installed uh, with the Windows build support. So we're just going to hit Done and let that install. Um, yes, cool. And then let's switch over to this really quick. So we're going to create a new project. And it's going to be a 3D project. And then we're going to name this Rollaball. And so the name doesn't matter for the project, uh, just you know whatever you want it to be. And then the location also doesn't matter, but you want to make sure it's somewhere that makes sense. So we're going to create that. And while we wait for that to create, let's go back to the slides and check this out. So that's, that's, that's the wrong button. That's the right button. So this is a tutorial that is available uh, in video format uh, on learn.unity.com. Unity Learn is a platform that helps developers and students and whoever really wants to learn Unity to, to actually learn some of the basics and complex parts of Unity. Um, if you're a student, the Unity student plan is included for free with the GitHub student developer pack. Uh, just head on over to the link in the slide. Um, I think Hack Quarantine also mentioned some more stuff about this, but it's an amazing tool and you should definitely take advantage of it. And I believe right now because of the COVID uh, pandemic, Unity Learn is free for a couple months for everyone um, who has a Unity account. I thought I saw that on their website when I checked it out earlier today. Um, but that that's something you should definitely check out regardless. Okay, so this is still building. Okay, so let's just go ahead and, while we're waiting for this to build um, the project, um, this is what you should see um, once your project is created. So my theme is going to be dark because I have Unity Plus, but uh, regardless, this is the general layout you should see. If if the windows are in a different order, that's fine. Um, the main ones we care about are the uh, scene view, the game view, uh, the inspector, the console, and then project and hierarchy. Those are the main ones we're going to be using. I think it's done. Perfect. Here we go. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at our project window and we're going to notice that we have a folder in here already. It's our only uh, folder and it has something in it called the sample scene. So what we're seeing right now inside this game window and the scene window is our sample scene. Um, there's really nothing in it because our scene is empty besides the camera uh, and a directional light. So we need to add some stuff to that. But before we do that, we're going to add some more folders so we can organize our uh, content that we create. So let's create a folder called scripts which will store all of our code. Let's create a folder called materials, which will store all of our materials. And then we're going to create a folder called prefabs, which will store all of our prefabs. And we'll get to what prefabs are in just a minute. <clears throat> OK. So we've created those. Uh, and to create them, just in case you missed it, you right click inside this window. And then you hit create and then folder. And this is how we're also going to create C sharp scripts and materials, but we're going to get to those in just a second. Okay, so now that we've done that, let's uh, actually make a, an object for our game. So this is going to be rollerball, and we're just going to roll this ball around and collect some coins. 
Um, and there's going to be some walls and uh, a floor we're going to roll on along with our player. So let's go ahead and create the uh, plane that our player is going to roll around on. So we're going to right click inside the hierarchy window and then we're going to go to hover over 3D object and we're going to select plane. And so we'll notice that it's selected here. We can see it here. Let's double click on the plane in case it's not in view. Uh, double clicking brings it into full view. Um, okay. So then you'll notice here in the Inspector tab, it's basically all the properties of our plane game object. Uh, it's currently at position 0, 3, 0, it has no rotation, and its scale is 1, 1, 1. Let's move that uh, position down to 0. You can do it manually by typing in a 0 here and then hitting Enter. Um, or, you know, if you want to, let's say if it's in a weird position, you don't want to type it all out. If you right click here, you can hit the Transform Reset, which resets it to 0, 0, 0 for the position, rotation, and 1, 1, 1 to the scale. <clears throat> OK, so now that that's done, let's name our uh, plane to ground. So to do that, select the object in the hierarchy window, right click, rename, and then let's just type in ground. Another way to create game objects, in case you don't want to use the hierarchy window, is you can go up here under the top bar, click Game Object, 3D Object, uh, and Plane. You can do this for every uh, everything you could do with the right click here is available to do in here. Excuse me. Another way to rename uh, the ground object is to just come into once you select it, come to the inspector and rename it to whatever you want. It should it will update in real time in the hierarchy window as well. Okay, so we centered that. All right, so this ground object that we've got here is actually pretty small. It's only one by one by one um, in the scale. So let's bump that up a little bit. Uh, we're going to want to go to two by two by two, or sorry, two by one by two. Um, Unity plane objects, it's, it's the planes are primitives in Unity. So you're going to notice there's actually no depth to this. Even if I did go to two or three for this uh, Y component of the scale, it's not going to do anything. If you do set it to zero, however, it will make it uh, do some funky stuff. So let's just not do that. OK, so now we've got our ground. Let's create our player object. This is just going to be a basic sphere. So let's do the same thing we did before, but let's select sphere this time. And then let's reset that right away and set that to 0.5 on the Y for position. All Unity primitives, um, excluding plane, I believe, are have a diameter, uh, if you want to call it that, of 1. So we just want to lift this 0.5 up so it is just above the plane. OK, let's rename this to player. Then we can go ahead and take a look here. What our player currently has is a transform component, a mesh filter component, a mesh renderer component and a sphere collider. The collider just handles all the physics um, for collisions. Um, it, we're going to also add a rigid body to it later, which handles the actual physics calculations for you know what should it do based on the situations. But this determines the bounding box for it. The mesh render and the mesh filter both um, are used to display what we see in front of us. I could change this out to a cube by clicking on that little sphere. I could do a cube, and it displays the cube. Excuse me, but we want to keep it as a sphere because cubes can't roll around. <clears throat> All right, what do we do next? Um, let's save, because Unity doesn't auto save our features. That uh, auto save what we uh, create in the scene or you know edit in the scene. Uh, and one way to notice this is if I go ahead and change this to one or whatever, you'll notice up here that this there's a star here and then there's a star over here in the sample scene. So the star, there's two stars in the top bar, the one in the top bar, one in the sample scene. That indicates that you haven't saved your content. Unity does have an autosave feature, but it's really not intended for us to use. It's more for them to use for when you en enter and exit play mode to save changes um, from between them. OK. Um, another way to save, uh, I didn't actually, did I say how to save? I don't think I did. Um, so you just hit File, Save, um, and it'll save. Uh, and then Control S also saves. All right, cool. So right now our player and our ground are the same like color, same material on them. It's kind of boring. We want to make it you know nice. So let's go ahead and 
enter the materials folder we're gonna right click create we're gonna create a material let's call it uh, ground background ground doesn't matter what it is we just have to make this readable to us so we know where this is going and then once you've got that selected you can check the inspector tab we're just going to use the standard shader uh, we've got a bunch of options here we don't really need to get into them all we care about is this one right here which is the color so since this is our ground let's make it a blue color so if we click on this uh, right here the box next to the color picker we can select any color along this wheel we will pick a good blue color you can also enter in the RGB values from 0 to 225, 1 to 0, or the HSV values manually here. Also, hex values can go down here. So now that we've got that blue, we want to apply this to our ground object. So one way to do this is to go ahead and select the ground game object in the hierarchy and go to the mesh render and change the material this way manually. Um, but that you know it can be kind of tedious. Um, so another way to do it is if you just click and drag, uh, the material and drag it onto the object you want inside the scene window it will update it but it won't it won't be permanent once you let go of the mouse click it will you'll notice in the game window it does not do anything only on the scene view and then also uh, yeah, just the scene view okay let's, let's, <clears throat> let's do this again let's create another material um, let's call this one coin this is going to be uh, on the game objects that we're going to be picking up as we roll around. And let's make this one yellow, because coins are yellow, I think. That's what the games you know, always happen to be. All right, let's uh, go back to, let's go to our scripts folder for the first time. Right click inside of here, and let's create a C-sharp script. We're going to call this one player controller. And it will automatically create C -sharp, a C -sharp script here called playercontroller.cs. And then to open it, you can right click and open, or you can just double click on it. So for myself, I prefer to use Sublime Text. Um, I installed OmniSharp and a couple other packages to help me get some autocomplete features and stuff like that that's useful for Unity. A lot of people uh, prefer to use uh, Writer or VS Code or um, Visual Studio. Uh, any of those are fine. Even a basic text editor is fine, like, you know, a notepad would work. Um, you're just not going to get some of those autocomplete features that are pretty nice. I also use Tab 9 for autocomplete, which is really helpful. Okay, so this is the script that we want our, like, to, to control our player. So it's gonna, our player is gonna move around, so we're gonna need to handle some input, um, and we're going to handle some collisions and do some other stuff, but let's just focus on that input for now. So we've got two uh, methods in here right now. We've got a start and an update. The start method is called exactly once, right before the first frame update. Um, this is, and then the update method is called once every frame our game runs. Um, and it's at the same time. There's an execution order, which we'll get into in a minute once we add a different uh, update method. But uh, it basically goes start, uh, awake, start, update, and some other things. But we don't really care about that. <clears throat> okay. So let's add a public float variable that we're going to call speed. This will let us, uh, a public variable attached to a script um, or in a script will let us manually edit it inside of the in, uh, inspector, which uh, is very good for editing variables on the fly during runtime. We're also gonna create a private rigid body, RB, just a reference to that. Okay, and then in startup, we want to get a we want to figure out, like, we want to get a reference to this rigid body. What rigid body are we talking about? We haven't defined it up here, so if we want to use it, we have to say, oh, this is the rigid body I'm talking about. Okay, so if we go ahead and save this, and we come back to our editor, it's going to compile some code, and then the type or namespace rigid body could not be found. Did I misspell something? 
that's never happened before. <laughs> Rigid body. What am I missing? Huh. Alright, let's continue. Let's pretend that didn't happen. Um, so, let's click on our player object, uh, and then let's come down here. Oh, I'm not going to be able to add it, am I? I'm not. Okay. Well, let's add a rigid body to our player first. I'll try and figure this out while we do that. So, if you select your player object in the hierarchy, you're going to be able to see it in the inspector tab, or the inspector window. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom, you can add components to it. So, components... Everything you see here is a component. The transform is a component. The mesh filter is a component. Any script you write is a component that you can add. So we're going to want to add a rigid body to our sphere because it's going to be rolling around, and we want its physics to interact with it, the physics engine to interact with it. So let's do that. The type of namespace. That's so weird. These are correct. Let's just delete that really quick. Let that recompile. Okay, so I fixed the error. And let's add the player controller. All right, cool. So we save right there. And we'll notice that we can see the speed variable. If we click here and drag, we can change it. We can also type in whatever value we want. Let's go with 10 for now. Excuse me. Okay, so let's try and do that again. Let's add. The rigid body component. I'm spelling it correctly. I do not know why this is happening. This is very embarrassing. Okay. Let's just continue on anyways. We won't be able to test this for now, but I know it works. I did this earlier. All right, so insider update method. Uh, well, actually first, let's change this to fixed update. So the update method is diff a bit different from fixed update. Um, fixed update is tied more towards the physics engine, and since we're going to be interacting directly with that, we want to use fixed update. Okay, so let's create two floats here. Let's do one called move horizontal, and that will equal input uh, get axis horizontal. And then let's make another one called move vertical, and we'll have that be input .get axis vertical. So what this does is that uh, on your keyboard you've got the arrow keys up, down, left, right. Uh, the horizontal, Unity has some default input bindings, uh, which for horizontal would be the left and right keys, and for vertical would be the up and down arrow keys. So this will get between a, I believe, a negative one and one value, excuse me, um, depending on which key you pressed, uh, and then it will store that in this float variable. So if you press up, it's going to store a 1 in the move vertical. If you press left, it'll be a negative 1 in the move horizontal, um, and, and stuff like that. Okay, so let's go ahead and convert that into a movement. So we're going to convert that into a vector 3 that we call movement. It's going to equal new vector 3 move horizontal. Uh, new vector three, and then okay, so new vector three has an x, y, and a z component, and so horizontal for us is going to be the uh, I'm sorry, uh, the x component is going to be the move horizontal for us. We're not going to be moving up and down in world space, so we can just do 0 0.0f, and then move vertical will be our z component, and then let's just do rigid body dot add force. Oops movement. Okay. So this is going to still have the error. Why is that the error? Am I... No? Hmm. All right, I'm just going to try something really quick. Just going to delete my code and copy paste it into a new file. Maybe the 
this will work. Hmm. Let's check something really quick on my end. Mm. Oh, I know why. I am an idiot. I am so sorry. Okay. <laughs> so it is not rigid body with a capital B, it's the lowercase b. And that's, yeah. That's fun. Okay, what's another one? Oh, we got another error. Oh yeah, body. It should be RB. Okay, so this is what our code should look like. We've got our speed variable, our reference to rigid body that we then set at the startup, uh, and then we get our floats for horizontal and vertical movement uh, inputs. We convert that to a vector three, and then we add that as a force to our object. Okay, so save that, come back to here, what is it complaining about now? Ah, right here. I, there's two of them. OK. Cool. So now that's done. Let's go to our player. Let's see. We've got our player controller script on him. Uh, our speed is 0, but we haven't multiplied it by the speed yet. So we're just, we're just moving the player by the force that we've got. Uh, from our input. So let's hit play in the editor and then now I'm just gonna move around and it's working. Cool, our sphere is moving. This is awesome. However, it's really slow and not fun to play around with. I don't think this would be a very fun game. So let's go ahead and I oh, have to exit play mode. Let's multiply our movement by the speed variable. Okay, so then we hit play, let's modify this to 10, and then we click inside the game view to resume focus, and it's much better. Perfect. That's so much better. Um, okay, so now if we go select player again, once we've exited play, you'll notice that the changes I made during play mode have reverted. So this will always happen uh, within Unity, so just be aware of that and make your changes if you make your changes in play mode, write down what you've made changes to so you can fix them once they get reset outside of play mode. Cool. Let's... What's next? Okay, cool, the camera. So right now, this is the scene view, and we can move around whoever we want, but when we actually make and play our game, build and play our game, this is what our camera will look like in this game display over here. And that's not a very good angle. So let's go ahead and set our camera, select our camera, and let's set its transform to be 10, 0, 10, negative 10. And then we'll change that uh, X rotation to 45 degrees. This will give us a good viewing area. OK. So what we want is we want this camera to follow the ball around, uh, but we don't want to directly child it to the player. So if I were to just take this camera, drag it over the player to child it to the player, we're going to notice some pretty weird stuff happening. Well, not more weird, more of very uh, concerning. I don't think that'd be a very fun game to play. Uh, and so what, what happens is, is as the ball rotates around, the camera, which is currently um, in this relative position to the ball, wants to always maintain this relative position to the ball. So as the ball rotates, the camera will just move in space to maintain that relative position. So we don't want that, but we do want it to follow the ball around. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new script called camera controller. We're going to open that one up. Once it finishes compiling. And we're going to get rid of, actually, we're not getting rid of anything. We're just going to add a new reference up here, public game object player. And then we're going to do another one, private vector3 offset. Okay, 
and then on the startup we want to set this offset to be equal to the transform dot position which is the whatever whatever this script is attached to whatever game object it is it this gets the transforms position so the position of this game object then we want to subtract the player dot transform dot position so we want to get the vector between the two objects and this player can be whatever you want it to be. We just named it player so we know that this is going to be our player game object. And then in the, we want to go to late update. We want to make this late update, not update. And we're going to go and say transform.position, which is the camera's position in this case, equals player.transform.position plus the offset. So we want to wait until after fixed update, which is what late update does. And we're going to get the current play position of the player. And then we're going to add this offset to it. So let's go ahead and save this. Wait for it to compile. And then we're going to add component on the camera. We're going to call it camera controller. And we'll see here we've got this empty uh, field. What we can do is we can click and drag the player object onto it. And now it is linked. So now the code knows that the player game object we are talking about is in fact the player game object uh, in our scene. So if we go ahead and save and play this, we'll notice that our camera will follow the ball around but not have that weird rotating mess that happened earlier. That's pretty good. Okay. <clears throat> what do we want to do next? Well, we want to add walls to our game. So right now we can fall off the map and that's not very fun. So let's go ahead and uh, create a new game object, an empty game object uh, in the hierarchy. We're going to call it walls. Let's rename it to walls. And then let's, re let's just center this. We want it to be 0, 0, 0, all zeros with a scale of 1. So let's reset it. Well, it's in the center of the area. And now let's create a 3D object cube. We're going to name this west wall. We name it West Wall. We're gonna reset everything for that. We're going to then child it to walls, and then we're gonna modify its scale to be 0.5, 2, and then 20.5. And you'll notice that 20.5. Oops, that's the wrong window. 20.5 just goes. It goes just long enough to go past the play area, so we can have this be on the corners and there would be no gaps in the corners what we could escape from all right so our west wall is going to want to be want, want to have a position of negative 10 so that means i am backwards cool so this this position this transform right here is is a a local transform so if we drag this off the walls we'll notice that it stays the same as if it was on walls. This is because the walls are centered at 0, 0, 0, which is where all the coordinates for world space are centered around. So there is practically no difference um, for this transform. However, if we were to move the wall to here, you'll notice that west wall still has the same transform as before, but walls doesn't. So if we unchild it, west walls, is, uh, oops, west walls position is now different. So that's something to take note of. All right, cool. Our wall has a box collider, which will let us know that we've collided with it, preventing us from going past it, which is good. And so what we're going to want to do is we're going to duplicate this wall three times. So let's just one, two, three. Control D also works to duplicate. We'll rename this one east wall. Rename this one north wall. and south wall. Okay, so we've got four game objects right here in the same spot, but we need to move them around. So for east wall, what we can do is we can just make this a 10 value instead of a negative 10. For the north and south walls, it's going to be a bit different. What we need to do is we need to rotate these by 90 degrees on the y-axis, and then we need to move them by 10 units on the z-axis instead of the x-axis. Let's do that for both. This will be a negative 10, 0, 90. And there we go. We've got walls. So we cannot fall off our game now. It's pretty cool.
Awesome. <clears throat> what we want to do next, uh, let's see. We want to create coins. Cool. So we're not going to get into how to 3D model, you know, a pretty looking coin or anything like that. We're just going to be original, I guess, and we're going to we're just going to create a cube. Trust me. It'll make sense, maybe. Who knows? Uh, we're going to call this coin because it looks like a coin. We're going to reset its transform. And then if we zoom in on it, we can double click on the coin. We'll notice that the player is kind of in the way. So let's select the player and then let's just click this checkbox up here in the inspector tab. All it does is it just deactivates it from the scene. It just hides it, so to speak. Um, it, it still exists in the scene. If you have a reference to this game object, you could reactivate it. Um, it hasn't deleted it, it's just not, the engine isn't recognizing it right now. Um, this would be like if you have a bullet uh, that you don't, like you shoot from a gun in your game and you don't want it to be destroyed, you just want to hide it for some reason, you would just deactivate it with code like that. Okay, so let's scale this cube to 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, make it a little bit smaller than the player. Let's move it up. 0.5 units, and then let's rotate it by 45 degrees on each axis. There we go, it's just barely above the ground. So that's going to be our coin. Totally looks like one, I know. Okay, so let's go to our material that we created for the coin, and let's just click and drag it on the coin. It's good enough. And Let's go ahead and make our first prefab. So if you go into the hierarchy, gra grab your coin and drag it to the prefabs folder, you'll notice that it creates a coin object in here. And it changes this uh, icon up here and this to blue. So what we've done is we just created our first prefab. A prefab is just a reference to a game object that you can create multiple, multiple times over and over and over again. And what's nice about it is that, let's say you know I duplicate this coin, I've got two coins right here. And I make a change to this coin, th this coin prefab, and I say, you know, make it one, one, one. It changes both of the, it changes all of the prefabs in the scene at the same time. So let's undo that. Sounds good. Just delete that for now. Cool. What time are we at? Oh, we're good on time. Cool. So now these coins are kind of bland on their own. Let's make them rotate uh, just for fun. So let's go to our scripts folder, right click, create C sharp script, and let's call it rotator. Wait for that to load, open it. So this script's gonna be very, very simple. All it's gonna have in it is an update method. And inside that update method, we're just going to say transform.rotate. And we're going to rotate it on a vector three uh, axis, or a ve yeah, a vector three. And we're going to say 15, 30, 45. And let's multiply this by time dot delta time. And let's go ahead back to our coin prefab scroll down to add component on the prefab, not on that itself. And we can clear this error, we don't care about that. Because our rotator script has been added correctly. So time.delta time here is, I believe, I don't remember the exact definition, but I believe it is the time in between frames um, yeah, so I think it, it, it's tied somewhat to the frame rate to smooth things. Uh, like, because if we just did this, uh, and let's say we had a really slow computer with this transform.rotate, every frame it's going to rotate this by this amount. Um, uh, not along that axis, sorry, or like by that amount. Um, but if we have a really slow frame rate, it's going to rotate this very slowly. If you have a really high frame rate, like, you know, 120 FPS, this is going to spin way too fast for us. So we multiply it by the time in between frames to smooth things out. That's what I believe it does. I can't remember the exact definition though. 
So if we go ahead and play this, we'll notice that our coin is rotating. And if we look here, even though we didn't touch the coin uh, game object in the hierarchy, because we added the script to the prefab uh, in the project window, it added it to the coin. And that rotation is good enough. You can mess around with that however you want. Um, but for now, this is all we need. <clears throat> okay, so currently our game has no way of telling the difference between uh, this coin that we have and a wall when it collides with it. We're going to write that collision code in a second, but it, it has no easy way of saying, oh, I have just collided with the wall or the ground or this coin, you know? So let's go ahead and click on the coin prefab. We're going to click on the tag component. It's untagged, and we're going to add a tag. So this will take us to a new window, or new content for the inspector tab called tags and layers. And we're going to add a new tag to our tag list. We don't have one right now, but let's just add one called coin. Go ahead and save that. And now what we have to do is we have to go back to the coin prefab, and now we can add the coin tag. So this is a way of letting, we're going to write some code earlier that's going to say, hey, does, does the thing I've collided with have this tag? Yes or no? It's easier because it's, you don't have to do, you know, what's the name of this game object? Or does this game object have certain properties? You just, you just have this tag that's easy to use. It's the recommend, recommended way of doing it. Cool. So I think that we're good enough on that. Oh, one more thing. Before we get off this prefab, we need to modify the collider. So let's go ahead and move our coin to the side first, and let's reactivate our player. So if I play this game, or you know, play the edit mode version, if I roll towards the coin, I run into it. I bonk into it. It's not very productive. Uh, you know, even if we delete these coins as we hit them, there's still the we're still hitting the coin itself and it's going to slow down our momentum. So what we need to do is we need to say that this coin's collider is a trigger. What that does is that, oh, I have to focus back in the game. Excuse me. What that does is it tells the physics engine that whenever something collides with it, don't actually update the physics components of whatever collided with it. Don't, it, it interacts with the physics engine still. It just has a trigger instead. It's a, it's a flag that gets popped and says, hey, something's collided with me, so um, notify the code that something has collided with me, but don't actually change the physics, which is very useful for our game. Okay, so let's go out of edit play mode and let's reselect that trigger and save. Oh, we have to do that. Sorry, I did that on the coin itself. That's wrong. Undo that. We need to do that on the coin prefab, not the coin game object. You save, and then it has edited here. Perfect. Okay, so let's uh, let's place some coins. Let's do about twelve coins. Um, move our camera up, and then let's hit Control D, and just start moving our coins around. It doesn't matter where they are. I do a circle around the uh, object because it's easy. What are we at? Six, seven, this is eight, nine, 10, 11. Uh-oh, need one more. That's, that's a sphere, totally. Good enough. Cool, let's save that. And then if we play this, we'll notice that all of our coins are spinning and we can run into them. Well, we can't run into them, but we can go through them. Cool. So now let's handle the code that uh, deals with the collisions. So we need to go back to our player controller script. And we're going to add a method down here called void on trigger enter with the parameters, oops, collider, collider. For the sake of that, yeah. So because we set our coin uh, collision to be is trigger, we have to use the on trigger enter here. Um, if you were to use a collider uh, or not to not have it be a trigger, you would use on collision enter. Um, and the input parameters would be slightly different. 
But we don't do that, uh, one, because we don't want our ball to lose momentum, and two, this the on collision enter will happen whenever we bonk into a wall for the first time and the very first time we touch the floor, which will be the first frame. And we don't really want that to happen because that wastes processing power on top of that. Okay, so let's do if other dot game object. Oh, whoops. Collider other, not collider collider. So the other thing we collide into here, if other dot game object dot compare tag coin. So what this does is it says, okay, I've collided, I've I've, I've hit. I've triggered this other collider. This is the first frame I enter collision with them. Uh, grab the game object, and then the tag on that game object, is it equal to coin or not? If it is equal to coin, then we do other.gameObject.setActive false. Excuse me. And so now if we save this, go back to our game, wait for it to compile, Should probably open Twitch chat. <laughs> I did not do that. All right, cool. So we're deactivating all of our coins. We're not deleting them. We can still see them over here uh, in the hierarchy, but they are deactivated. Right, so let me just open Twitch chat really quick. I should have had this open in case anyone had questions. Apologies about that. Cool. Let me that. We're good. Awesome. So now that we've got uh, collisions enabled, we need to keep track of, um, you know, when we collide with the coin, when we interact with this coin, we want to keep track of that, how many we've uh, interacted with. And we want to display that score that we've got, since that's the whole point of our game. So let's go back to our player controller code. Let's zoom in a bit. And let's add some things to the top. We're going to add a public text count text, a public float, oh, sorry, public text win text, and a public int count. So if we save this, we'll notice that it errors out. Um, and it's because we haven't, it doesn't know what text is. We have to import that uh, namespace, so just using unity engine.ui will give us access to all these UI features, which we will uh, create in a minute in the editor. Okay, so on startup, we want to set our count equal to zero. Uh, we want our win text to equal nothing, because we don't want this to display currently uh, at the start of the game. And then we're just going to call a method called set count text. Okay, so if we scroll down, we're gonna add some code to the, where is it? Where's my slide? All right, we're gonna add some code to the on trigger enter. Uh, we're gonna say, once when we've collided or triggered one of these coins, we're just gonna do count plus, right, so count equals count plus one count plus plus also works, um, or count plus equals one also works. But let's just do count equals count plus one. And then we're going to say, we, we want to update the count text, so set count text. That's what we did up here. So since our count is zero at the start, we want to say that we've got no coins collected. And whenever we get a coin, we want to say that we've, we want to update that text. So let's scroll down a bit, make some room, and add a method called, oh, that's the wrong button. I'm going to add a method called set count text. And we'll move that down. In this, we're going to do count text dot text equals count colon space and then plus the count dot two string. 
So our count text is a text UI element, and one of the properties of it is dot text. That if we by editing that we can it's a get set. So we can get the current text or we can set the current text to be whatever we want. We're going to set it whenever we grab a coin to be count, then plus the number of coins we've collected. After that, we want to check to see if we have reached, if we've collected all the coins. And we put 12 coins down, so let's do count greater than or equal to 12. The moment we have gathered 12 coins, let's set the win text, text to be equal to you win. All right, so now we need to create two UI elements. We're almost done. So let's go back to our editor. I think we're good on time. What's going on? String to UI dot, where is that? What's going on? Oh, whoops, win text dot text in the start method. My, my mistake, apologies. So yeah, win text dot text equals nothing because the moment we win, we're gonna set that text equal to something. Okay, so let's go back into here, let it compile, error should clear, perfect. So let's go ahead and right click in the hierarchy, go to UI, and we'll create a text element. We'll notice that three things were created. We've got a canvas, we've got a text element, we have an event system. We don't care about the canvas or event system for now. All we care about is this text element. We're going to rename this to count text, and we're going to create another one, UI text. Nope, that's a child of it. So I just clicked and dragged it so it's not a child of that count text. And we're going to name this one, oh, oh there we go, uh, win text. So for the count text, we want this to be in the upper left-hand corner. So if we go to the inspector after selecting it, we're going to change its uh, anchor using this right here uh, to be the top left anchor preset. We're also then going to change the pivot to be 0, 1. We're going to change the x to be 10, negative 10. And we're going to keep the uh, width and height the same. And so you'll notice in our game tab, or game window, we have a new text up at the top. The win text is the one at the bottom, so our count text is the one up here. Now our text is black and it's very hard to read on the background, so let's go ahead and change that to white text. And that looks pretty good um, for this view. So let's go ahead and save that and let's go to win text. Now for this one we want to keep it centered. Let's zero it. Uh, we'll see it very, very barely visible in the center. Let's bump that up to 24 uh, on the font size. Let's scroll down to font. Uh, the, uh, the text, change the font size to 24, and let's change that to white color. So now it's very visible. However, it's kind of in the way, um, so we don't, we don't want to block our ball. So let's go ahead and move that up 75 units. And it still, still looks kind of weird because it's, it's not centered properly. So let's go ahead and middle adjust this using the alignment tool and the, the text component. And let's do a vertical alignment as well, just to make things perfectly centered. All right, and now we just need to go to our player game object, scroll down to our player controller, click and drag these uh, text components so we can link them. So we'll do win text to win text and count to count text. Save the game, or save our changes, and we'll hit play. So we'll notice that our text in the top left corner has changed from new text to count colon zero, and our win text has become hidden. So now if I go ahead and roll around, I've gathered one and two, and we can see the count updating. Oh, whoops, went too fast. Oh no. And then there we go. We've won. Okay, and then the last step, uh, I think I'm almost out of time. The last step uh, to, to make your game done, uh, to finish your game, is to go ahead and build it. So let's go to build settings. In the file build settings, we'll get this window. 
we need to, before we can do anything, we have to add the current open scene um, because right now we have no scene selected that we're going to build. We have to select the correct uh, platform to build on. This is Windows computer, so that's perfectly fine. And then we just have to go to build and run. It's going to pop up, where do you want to build this? I don't really care where I build this. I'm just going to build it right here in this folder. You usually want to build, have a, a different folder for your builds just to keep things organized, but we don't really care about that for now. It's going to take a second to build. Depending on what platform you build for, the build times can vary. For Android, it takes a lot longer than for Windows, in my uh, experience. Give this a second. Hopefully, it builds it to the correct. Build, okay, it played it on the other screen. How do I show this? Okay, I'm going to edit my OBS really quick so you guys can see it. Oh, oh God. Uh, edit properties. Display one. Okay, there you go. So it's built to full screen. We can see our count text in the top left. And we've got our built game. And what's nice about this is that when you build a game, it builds an executable version of the game along. with all of the necessary Unity uh, components that it needs to run this game as a standalone. So you, the pers if you want to build this and ship this on Steam, you can do that right away. Um, at, whereas if you didn't, if you haven't built it, what happens is, is that it, you can only play this game if you have the entire Unity project. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, change back. Cool. Alt F4. Yeah, and that's it. Um, are there any questions? I apologize for not being in chat earlier. Did not. It skipped my mind. <clears throat> oh. It's, Huge delay. Okay, well, oh, URL for the code? Oh, hey, Shriash, how's it going? So the URL for the code, uh, so there is no URL for the code. Um, I do have this, all these slides up, which is a step-by-step documentation of how to do this. It's available at scub3d.io slash hack underscore quarantine. It just is a redirect to the PDF version of these slides. That'll be available until uh, the end of the hackathon, um, whenever that is. Um, but if you want to have a video tutorial of this, check out the VOD of this. Um, and then go, if, if you want more of these things, uh, more of these tutorials, Go to learn.unity.com. Definitely recommend it. Um, we can go there right now, actually. And take a look at it. Plug Unity really quick. Unity is available on Linux. Um, it, you, there is a way to download Unity Hub for Linux. You have to go to the Unity forums to do so, though. Um, and, and I don't know how, how up-to-date those builds are, but they are fairly up-to-date. The most uh, recent versions of Unity are being released on uh, Mac and Windows computers, however. Yeah, so here we can see the Rollball tutorial. There's uh, in-app purchases if you're doing mobile apps. You can see all these projects and courses. And then uh, all users uh, get three months of complimentary access to Unity Learn Premium, which gives you these gives you access to these amazing courses about how to optimize performance in your games, how to do you know game prop modeling, working with certain things like Cinema Machine, making trailers, uh, stuff like that. So definitely uh, recommend uh, checking it out for Mac. Yeah, this uh, Unity was originally developed for Macs, um, so it definitely definitely works on Macs. Cool and. 
unless anyone has any other questions, I think that's it for me. Let's wait a couple of